tide mill has existed on this site for nearly 900 years. This mill as we see it today was built on the foundations of the previous mill in 1793. Water mills vary in the way they work. This is how our mill works. We are situated on the inner estuary of the River Deben, so effectively this part of the Deben may be considered part of the sea and has an average tidal range of approximately 4 metres. This mill derives its power from the rise and fall of these tides. As a tide rises it fills our mill pond via a pipe fitted with a one-way valve. This one-way valve allows the mill pond to be filled with the incoming flood tide to the height of the tide. Yet importantly, the sea's tidal height is retained in the mill pond after the tide has ebbed and goes out to its lower tidal level. In order to mill, the mill awaits until low tide. At low tide, we have the greatest possible difference between the high tide level that's been retained in the mill pond and the low level of the estuary itself. This gives us the greatest gravitational mass possible with any given tide. This gravitational mass is also commonly referred to as a head of water. The mill pond can itself be considered a battery storing this energy and the seawater itself as a propulsion system. It is this gravitational mass or head of water that actually powers the mill. When the sluice is open, the water, as a propulsion system powered by the gravitational mass, is directed against the paddles of the water wheel. This turns the wheel and transfers the energy to the machinery inside the mill. The mill we are now in was designed and built in 1793, almost entirely out of wood. With advances in technology, the main cogs that transferred the energy to the millstones were modernised in 1850 with cast iron. However, the water wheel and the main load-bearing parts are still of wooden construction. The water wheel is connected by a 22-inch thick oak shaft to the pit wheel cog. The pit wheel engages with the horizontal wallower cog above it. This rotates the main vertical shaft that runs all the way up to the crown floor. Connected to this main vertical shaft above the wallower is the great spur wheel cog. Satelliting the great spur wheel, there are four smaller cogs called stone nuts. The stone nuts are directly connected to each of the four millstones on the stone floor above. These stone nuts have to be engaged with the great spur wheel before we can start milling. Before any of this, we have to load grain in the grain bins at the top of the mill. Originally, the mill only had ladders between each floor. Considering the weight of a sack of grain, the only way to get the grain to the top of the mill is by a sack hoist. The hoist is powered by the mill itself. Once the grain is at the top of the mill, the miller loads the grain into one of the grain bins. From these bins there are chutes running directly to the millstones on the stone floor below. To start the milling process, the stone nut is engaged to the great spur wheel downstairs. The shutter on the chute is open, allowing the grain to be fed into the millstone. On the pit floor at ground level, the miller has three straightforward control systems that can control the entire milling process. From this position, the miller can dictate the speed, primary grain flow and the gap between the stones, which all dictate the quality and grade of flour. This is the damsel. It is connected directly to the millstones. The faster the millstone goes, the faster the damsel shakes a small trough of grain 
feeding stone. The slower it goes, the slower the damsel shakes the grain into the stones. This means the damsel is automatically regulating and feeding the millstones with just the right amount of grain. The damsel automatically adjusts the flow for the varying speed of the stones. This helps to regulate the grade of flour that the mill has adjusted the controls for at the beginning of the milling session. The miller repeatedly tests the grade of flour by gently pressing the flour between his palm and thumb. This is where the phrase rule of thumb comes from. It is by this rule of thumb that the miller knows when and what control to adjust to improve the grade of flour. The gap between the stones, the primary flow of grain and the speed of the stones can all be altered. It is a process of continuous readjustment. Above the stone floor is the crown floor, where a crown-shaped wooden cog sits on top of the main vertical shaft. This giant cog turns a horizontal lay shaft that has a loose canvas belt attached. When the belt is tightened against the lay shaft, the sack hoist is activated. This system was designed to be powered by the mill and operated by the miller on the ground floor. All the power that is needed to run the mill is generated from the tidal energy stored in the mill pond that simply uses the rise and fall of the tidal water from our beautiful and unspoilt Deben Estuary. Water mills are known to have been used by mankind from around the 3rd century BC. The tide mill being a particular type of water mill using the rise and fall of the tide. It was only the discovery of steam power which triggered the industrial revolution that saw the end of this use of natural power used for around 2000 years. The first record of a tide mill here was in 1170 when the owners applied for the legal right to cross private land to access it. Our knowledge of the early mills on this site is quite limited, but it is certain that the Augustinian canons of the local priory had ownership for several centuries until 1537. On the dissolution of the monasteries, the estate of Woodbridge Priory, including the Tide Mill, passed into the hands of Henry VIII in 1537. It remained the property of the crown until Elizabeth I came to the throne. In 1564, the Queen sold it all to Thomas Seckford, a statesman close to Elizabeth and a Woodbridge Town benefactor, remembered today through the Seckford Foundation. By 1792, it was owned by the Cutting family, who began the construction of a new mill in the following year. Cutting was a merchant and farmer who also extended the quay to take vessels of up to a hundred tons and enlarge the warehouse. The premises were mortgaged to cover heavy debts and by 1811 it was sold. It is this mill, dating from 1793, that we are preserving and celebrating today, over two centuries on. The Industrial Revolution saw the beginning of the end of this long-established type of mill. The steam engine was more efficient and convenient than any natural power source and the roller mill was many times more productive than millstones. Traditional milling declined. Out of around 200 tide mills in England before the Industrial Revolution, only 9 or 10 were left operating by 1938. In about 1900, the tide mill and the granary next door were clad in corrugated iron probably to save money on maintenance and painting. This was very unpopular with local artists, as the distinctive white weatherboarding was covered up. However, this money-saving yet rather ugly addition helped preserve the mill and keep it standing for another 70 years or so. But hidden from view, its structural condition continued to worsen. There was no money available for repairs, but in 1932, a new wheel was fitted so the mill could keep working at full capacity. In 1949, the Shell Film Unit included it in their Craftsman series with a film called The Tide Mill. Yeah. 
Amongst other commodities afforded by the sea, the inhabitants make use of divers creeks for grist mills by thwarting a bank from side to side in which a floodgate is placed with two leaves. These the flowing tide opening. Then after full sea, the weight of the ebb closeth fast, which no other force can do. And so the imprisoned water payeth ransom for his enlargement by driving an undershot wheel. That account of the harnessing of tidal power was written by the Elizabethan engineer, Richard Carew, 350 years ago. But Jim Desborough here has charge of a tide mill at Woodbridge in the English county of Suffolk that dates back more than 800 years. This is the paddle box housing the 20-foot diameter paddle wheel. The paddle wheel is on a shaft made of oak, 22 inches thick. And on the other end of the shaft inside is the pit wheel, the big one on the left. The pit wheel drives the wallower. That's the one on the right. The wallower is at the lower end of the main shaft that runs right up to the third story. On the main shaft, just above the wallower, is a great spur wheel driving four stone nuts. Here's one of them. Each of the stone nuts turns a separate pair of millstones for grinding the corn. Higher up the main shaft is the drive for the sack hoist, which works when that loose driving belt is pulled tight. Like this. Stones are running dry. Dry stones grinding together make sparks, and the mill is all wood. A tide mill can only work when the sea is below half tide mark. That means only four hours on, then close down to the next half tide about eight hours later. Tide milling is not a job that suits everybody, for the miller has to work to the tides and not to the clock. working tide mill in England, and the last of many that have served man's needs for the past 800 years. Woodbridge eventually became home to the last working mill in Britain. In 1954, the mill was bought by its last commercial owner and a hammer mill was installed on the ground floor, driven by a diesel engine housed outside in a shed attached to the mill, capable of grinding around four times as much product as the water-driven stones. In its last years, the mill mostly produced animal feed and using the hammer mill meant that the great water wheel stood idle for weeks, with some sections becoming thoroughly waterlogged. The result was that when the wheel was moved, it was completely out of balance, and eventually this stress caused the huge oak main shaft to break in 1957. The mill wheel dropped into the mill race, and this signalled the end of water-powered milling at Woodbridge after nearly 800 years. The Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings began a campaign to raise awareness of the historical importance of the mill. The hope of salvation came when Jean Gardner bought the mill at auction in May 1968, 
she purchased it with the specific intention of restoration and preservation. £50,000 was needed to start work, a trust was created, an appeal for funds initiated. Restoration work started in 1972. The mill opened to the public for the first time in 1973, once again clad in its brilliant white weatherboarding. There was little support other than a large amount of goodwill, and admission charges, donations and souvenir sales were all needed to maintain the mill in good condition. Shortly after the beginning of the new millennium, new signs of stress and deterioration were becoming apparent. The small new pond had become badly silted, reducing the time the water wheel and machinery could be demonstrated and making it impossible to do even a limited amount of grinding. Visitor numbers were reducing, and with the mill dependent on admission fees for its survival, there was little to spare for anything other than day-to-day -day repairs. By 2009, some of the wedges holding the huge water wheel on its massive shaft slipped, and once again the mill wheel was unable to turn. The Trust had already determined that a new restoration project was needed if the mill was to continue to be preserved over the long term. This time, though, over a million pounds was needed, and local sources, which had previously proved sufficient, could no longer be relied upon. An application for funding was made to the Heritage Lottery Fund, but without success. The project was amended and improved, and the Heritage Lottery Fund was approached for a second time in 2010. Early 2011 saw success, and the mill closed for the 2011 season for the improvements to be made. Enough work was completed by early 2012 to allow the newly restored and improved mill to open for the 2012 season. But today, as well as grinding flour, the mill is a living museum, managed by a charity dedicated to the preservation and demonstration of this important part of our industrial and cultural heritage, for the benefit of present and future generations. Of all the mills mentioned in the Shell film from the 1950s, the only one left still fully working at the time of making this film is Woodbridge.